Good uh, afternoon, everyone. It's me again. I am here because I want to do a quick, which will end up being an hour, as we all know, review of Gabor Mate's book, Scattered Minds. Um, I recently heard about this book, ironically, in passing on Joe Rogan's show, um, and they, he, there was a little snippet that came up in my feed, and I was like, oh, now I've heard of Gabor Mate for many years, but I just recently, because he's got another book out called um, The Myth of Normal, and um, what is that title called? That is, let's see. Um, sorry. Come on. <laughs> it doesn't want to give me it. Anyway, The Myth of Normal. Uh, yeah, The Myth of Normal, uh, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. Um, so, you know, he's, he apparently lives in, I got to follow him, actually. Apparently, he lives in Vancouver. I've got family in Vancouver, uh, and I have no makeup on. I look horrible. I know I'm so obsessed with this, but I'm like, whatever. Um, so yeah, I've heard about him for many years, but this just this recent thing. I said, oh, really? I'm like, I didn't know he wrote about ADHD. And apparently, he's got ADHD. And you know, over the last probably since about 2017, 2018, I have been doing more in-depth research about ADHD and what is called emotional dysregulation or cortisol dysregulation. Um, as I've stated before in previous videos, I was originally diagnosed at age 10, which was in 1978. I am now 54 years old with something, I, I was diagnosed with, quote, severe anxiety neurosis, okay? That was what was in a one-page document that I came across. Um, that was a report by my mother's, um, or by the psychiatrist or psychologist that was working with my mother. And it described what now really looks like borderline personality disorder. I mean, the the low self-esteem, the uh, wanting to unalive, like I didn't want to be alive. I mean, this was like reporting about things that were going on with me at age 10, 10. Now, my parents divorced in 77. So understandably, I could, I don't know when I was first being seen by a psychiatrist. I remember going uh, to a guy named, I won't say it, but anyway, I went to a child psychiatrist and I was playing with these stupid puppets and it was horrible. I hated it. I was so angry and so resentful. I had to go to these appointments. Um, but I recognized that I did have really, I, 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 I knew I was different. I knew that I was struggling with a lot of stuff. Uh, I remember having temper tantrums i.e. meltdowns when I was a kid, and I was very, struggled a lot in school, and I went to a private school, so it wasn't like I was in a public school environment or whatever, but I obviously had a very, you know, and, and I'm very defensive about this because I will state again, and I will continue to state till the day I die, that I know that my parents loved me. I did not come from a quote-unquote abusive environment. Um, I was very lucky. I know that a lot of people want to go, oh, well, you just need to be more grateful. And, you know, you were so blessed and you were so lucky. And I have I've carried that guilt that I have any kind of criticism for my parental, like for my parents. And I go, but I had so much. So why am I the way I am? I'm just using excuses. OK. And that'll be addressed. OK, because that. Is something that I really am pushing back against. And I really, that's the toxic culture that we live in, right? Anyway, back it up. So age 10, I said that I was diagnosed with severe anxiety neurosis, which sounds horrendous, right? I'm like, oh my God, like neurosis, you know? And then by 1980, I was, I know that I was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder because I remember that I was given, um, 
I was put on Ritalin at first. I'm currently on Ritalin again. And then I was put on Dexedrin as a kid. Um, and so I knew that I was different. And, you know, growing up in the 70s, you are, I, I really had extreme problems. I struggled in school. I was struggling in my classwork. I was having meltdowns. I remember having a meltdown. I wouldn't have my homework done. Um, I remember there was one time where I was sitting in class and this was when I was like maybe in sixth grade and the teacher was asking questions to the class and people were raising their, and, and this was a really weird thing. And I looked around and I said, people are actually paying attention. Like, oh, we're supposed to be paying attention to the teacher. I mean, I know it sounds utterly stupid, right? I mean, that sounds really retarded and, and, and like dumb, like, well, of course you should. But I mean, it was a big, like, it was a big, re 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 big revelation to me. You know, like I just like I was kind of waking up out of a fog like, oh, OK. I felt like my childhood was more of me being controlled by my emotional dysregulation and my nervous system rather than my brain. OK, if that makes sense. So like I was going through life just kind of in my own little world, like an autistic child, possibly. I mean, I'm not saying I have autism, but I mean, I can imagine that was like what, you know, you're kind of in your own world because it, it autism and ADHD are kind of on this spectrum thing they're showing. Um, not entirely autism itself. I am not an expert on autism because I've never identified as autistic, but um, their autism is on a spectrum. So you have like Asperger's and people and, and it probably is somewhat related. Like there's something like the, the whole nervous system and the way you interact with your environment. Um, so anyway, I really think that I, 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 I really felt like I was just in my own little world. Like I just didn't, like, I, I was struggling to be seen in a world. Like I remember one of my memories is that I'm standing in the window of my mother's bedroom because it overlooked our front yard and we lived on a private lane. So there wasn't a whole lot of traffic, but I felt like I, I had the sense of I am seeing out at a world that I'm 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 invisible and I'm seeing you and I can control it or I can't control it. Like it was just this kind of this weird sensation. Like I didn't feel like I was really a part of the world. I was looking through a window. I don't know why that's blurring. I was looking at a you know through the window out into the world. When I was growing up, I never felt like I belonged here. I always felt like literally that I was an alien. I actually have a little tattoo, a triangle tattoo on my chest. And it was more pronounced when I was a child. And it was kind of right in the center. It's like right here. It's very, very faded right now. But um, and I kind of was like, that's proof. That's that's my that's the mark of my body that I know this sounds really crazy. But anyway, it was like that kind of, I was like, that's where I came from, you know, like, I really, I always felt like I was an alien, and that I wasn't really supposed to be here, like, I, I dumped here, and, you know, maybe, and maybe that's my soul, you know, that maybe that's partially my soul, that, that I felt like I was put here, and I'm, like, trying to, you know, interact with the skin suit that I'm in, right, and then I don't, you know, it's a very broken thing, but that's kind of the way I felt growing up. And so Gabor Mate's book and, and previous books uh, that I recommend are The Body Keeps the Score, which is a more dense um, book, but it's one that kept coming up. And it's primarily in relation to PTSD and like soldiers and stuff. So a lot of the focus is more on that kind of trauma. And mainstream people and people that I have interacted with have stated you didn't have trauma like I, I get this like you know they're like so when you read a book like the body keeps the score which is more specifically about the PTSD experience like a soldier having gone to war or a severely physically abused child or a neglected child or whatever or natural disaster or something like that on the child people go yes that is trauma um, but as 
this science evolves, it is expanding. Now, a lot of people are still going to say, oh, well, of course it's going to expand. Like the whole thing about ADHD for the last decades has been very critical. Um, I will state that I do believe that ADHD is overdiagnosed. That does not mean that it is fake. Uh, and it's a complex thing. Um, but society at large is just so harsh in that it's like, oh, God, here we go again. All these fragile snowflake kids. Oh, they're so sensitive, blah, 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 blah. Now, my position has always been I do believe that it is really important to be resilient and to um, have a resiliency to be able to manage things. I mean, that just is what, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to suggest that everybody just live in a little, you know, delicate little cave to protect themselves, you know, but at the same time, you have to recognize that there are people who are definitely more fragile and it's not so much forcing the world upon them and say, well, you're just a fragile snowflake. You need to suck it up, you know, and that's the message in this world, especially in the United States, is that you just better suck it up, get, you know, put a thing. And like I, and I will repeat again, yes, you're right. People should try and strive to be more resilient and to be able to weather hardships. I don't think that you should be, you know, 100% protected against the world. The world is going to be a hard place. And if you can't handle it, then you're going to die, right? But at the same time, a lot of this stuff that's in our society is utterly unnecessary. Like, why are we creating a world that is harder than it's already going to be? Like, we have the choice as a culture and as a society to be humane and to be more compassionate and to be more empathetic and to promote you know balance and and love and these values right um more compassion rather than cruelty and spanking and beating and and like you know let's whip you into shape i mean i'm not pro-military at all i find that the military is utterly dysfunctional and dangerous okay um, the way that we train soldiers, they do it very deliberately to basically break pre-programming of the human body and rebuild it. So everything that is done during basic training is trauma that is intentionally imposed upon men and women in order to rebuild them into a soldier. Okay. It's deliberate and they're designed to be take orders to and and some of it works some of some soldiers are able to like go wow and they reject the programming but why anybody would want to go through that and, that and that's why you see there's certain psychological profiles that go into the military and they go on to big career militaries they go into high top top level secret black ops programs because they that's the way their brain is. And they're very, it works with them. And the military loves that kind of stuff because they like somebody that they can mold and then they can go out and be an order follower. Uh, my point is about the, uh, you know, this harsh, you know, suck it up, suck it up, suck it up. Be, you know, like push through, push through, push through, push through, you know um brutal kind of raising of children and people go well i was spanked and i was fine you know i don't think that that's healthy and i felt like i was never spanked really um and i'm not going to get into well i did another video but anyway <laughs> I, I really wasn't spanked. my parents tried to but I was such a little hellion, like energetically. I was like, you couldn't even get me. Like you'd have to chase me down the street in order to grab me. Like, you know, that was kind of how it was. And um, so physical discipline just wouldn't work with me. You can't push me as a person, me specifically, and expect to get good results. You can't yell at me. You can't um, be harsh to me. You can't sit there and say, suck it up, suck it up, suck it up. Now. Granted, my entire life, pretty much, I've been that drill sergeant. 
for myself because I was, I picked up very early on that that is the way the world is. Now, my parents may not have exhibited them. My stepfather did a bit. He was the first person that really kind of enforced, but of course he had his own issues because he had a very stern father and a very stern, strict upbringing. And so he imposed that or tried to upon me and I was already in high school, but you know, um, that was the first time I was ever disciplined. Like I was grounded for the first time after my stepfather came into the picture and But anyway, my my point is, is that I so I believe that, you know, yeah, we should all be more resilient. We should be able to to take on challenges. But there is a gentle parenting way that one can can encourage um, children to take on challenges, take on risks and to feel the confidence and the um, self-esteem to be able to do that and to experience failure. And I think we can do that in a very compassionate loving way rather than a very suck it up kind of way. I don't like the whole, you know, suck it up, get over it, you're get over yourself, quit living in the past. I mean, I've heard this message is so much spoken and unspoken in my entire life. You know, it, it just, it's, it's just the common belief, you know, I mean, and now you get it again. And usually it comes from the conservative point of our society and then liberals are accused of being too soft and too fragile. And now you get the whole, you know, fragile snowflake, like, oh, I'm offended. And I agree. Again, I want to reiterate, I believe that we should be more resilient and be able to like, hey, you know, I, I'm not going to deal with this. Like, I'm not going to allow this to crumple me. You know, I'm going to go into my, like, you know, into my shell and and because I can't handle it. Oh, my God, you said the wrong word. That's not healthy either. This is a continuum, folks. We need to be balanced. We need to be able to be compassionate at the same same time, have the self-confidence and the courage to be able to tackle and to handle what life deals with us. Okay. And unfortunately, we are either this or this. We're never in the balance. And I think that the goal for humanity is to achieve that that balance, you know to be compassionate at the same time, being strong and resilient, you know, and we don't, we're, it's, it's this battle constantly, you know, it's this harsh father of their terror. I can't speak today. Authoritarian father and the overly nurturing coddling mother, you know, it's like, those are the two forces that are constantly at play in our society. And it, it lurches and people that are more susceptible to this go to this side people that are more susceptible to this go to this side and there's never any real balance i'm about balance i'm about healthy balance and and so anyway i kind of got off the the review of the gabra mate book so i'm listening to this book i checked it out i got to actually buy a copy um but I'm, i checked a copy out of my library and it is like it was written for me it, it's oh so uh, body keeps the score was one of the earliest books i heard about then the book by bruce perry dr bruce perry and oprah winfrey uh what happened to you? good one but i think the gabor mate one uh is is the one that just really hits the nail on the head specifically for me um because i've never heard anybody really have a story like myself. And again, it's, it's a struggle because I was, I was very lucky. I'm not going to deny that I wasn't okay. That I wasn't blessed or that I should be more grateful. You're right. I had a very lucky childhood. I didn't say great childhood. <laughs> I said lucky. Okay. It could have been far worse. My mother was a very well-paid doctor. Um, and so I had a lot of opportunities that I didn't really take advantage of because of my issues. Um, however, my both my parents were alcoholics, but I was lucky that my mother at least became sober in 1972 and joined AA. And so she had been, and she was the primary person in my life 
that raised me. My parents got divorced. My father, who still loved me and did his best, despite all of the struggles he was having as an alcoholic, he was a good person. You know, he moved down to Texas. I saw him once once a week out of the year, but we talked. He wrote me letters. I have a big stack of letters from him. Um, he bought me Christmas presents. I mean, he did what he could do to be in my life as best as he could. Um, I do not fault him. I love him. He was he was a very kind person. You know, he really was. And he was struggling through his own stuff. So even though he wasn't really as present in my life as he should have been, um, it just was what it was. But I will never talk bad about my parents because they were dealing with their own stuff. And this is that whole generational thing. They were raised at a certain time and they had problems, right? My dad had a very dysfunctional mother and a very dysfunctional grandmother. And he being the older child was dealing with that stuff. And his brother had a very different experience, probably because he was the second child. It's kind of like, I hate saying this, relating this way, but down in the South, like that, my great grandmother was huge and she was a professional genealogist and librarian, which is probably where I got some of my librarian interest. Um, but she was apparently known as kind of histrionic and very controlling. That, that's my uncle who identified her as that. And she tried to control, and I don't know, she was very obsessed with this genealogy, like notoriety. And I got this from my grandmother who always said, you are of the man, like literally she told me, you are of the man of bone. Cause like down in the South, that was like big thing, you know? And I know that sounds racist and I'm not going to get into that, but I mean, I look back at my, my thing and it was like, I was descended from James Ladson, who's Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina. And I am like 16th cousins or something like that to Ursula von der Leyen, who's the president, current president of the United of the European Union. She's also descended by James Ladson. So we're cousins. Um, but it's just, but anyway, I, I say that because that was so ingrained in me. So my, my, um, my dad being the older son, it was like, there was a heap of that. Oh, well, you know, you are of this. I don't, she was just really into that. And I think he got a lot of pressure to be a civil engineer, like his dad and his grandfather. And, um, this, this line, like he was, in, he was in the society of the Cincinnati, which is like this G, you know, which is this, patrilineal, you know, thing. And it was James Ladson that we had that descendant, um, that connection. James Ladson was in George Washington's army. So just real quick side note, Society of Cincinnati, which is big for genealogists, is a uh, notable in those kinds of circles, um, thing where all of the lieutenants and generals and officers, well, I, was, I think it was officers, in George Washington's army came together and create, it's kind of an interesting um, society. I know people don't get into that anymore because it's very like, oh, that's the patriarchy kind of, you know. I mean, being from Cincinnati, uh, I'm a little bit more like, what is the society in Cincinnati? Um, but only the eldest son of this direct descendant can be a member. So it was big to like get that, right? And she was in the colonial game society and the sons of the American revolution and the whole nine yards. I mean, it was just like big into that. But anyway, as a side note, but I bring that up because I think there was a lot of pressure on my own father that caused a lot of dysfunction. There was uh, stories about my great grandmother hiding because my dad was apparently a very sensitive, kind of more empathetic, creative, introverted type, which I think I take over. Um, like he was just more sensitive. Like he was a very sensitive person. People always said he was really a nice guy. Um, and I think he just didn't, he, he didn't form, like, there was this weird story about my great-grandmother 
hiding in the bushes, watching my dad play to make sure that he was playing right, whatever that meant. I don't know what that meant. Maybe because they picked up that he was a little different and like, is he socializing the way he should be down the South? You know, that kind of stuff. And my mother's side, you know, she was the third child um, that was born the last. So she probably was an accident. Um, And she had her own her dad was an alcoholic and he was a episodic drinker, meaning that he really only binge drank. He would be fine throughout the year, but right around Christmas and the holidays, he would go out and get drunk on Christmas Eve and come home drunk. And he was very strict and, and all that. So she had her own issues. And I think she she reported that she was very um, insecure. She was very intelligent. You know, they both did very well in school. I didn't because not because I'm stupid, but because of my stupid ADHD, I didn't pay attention. Um, But she was, and see, this is what drives me up a wall. It's like, oh, I was a really high functioning ADHD and I did super well in school. And I'm like, I didn't, like, I'm not really that great at anything. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm not dumb, but I'm not succeeding and thriving, you know? (laughs) Um, but my mother was very, did she did, got all A's in school and all that other kind of stuff, went to medical school and everything. But she reported that she used to drink because it helped her to socialize. Like she felt more in the zone with regards to peer relationships, you know, and of course it was the fifties, everyone drank. So, um, yeah, so their alcoholism, they met, they partied. Um, But my mother went through her alcoholism. I heard her entire story. I haven't, I had it. She did, um, she went to a, they used to have um, these impaired physician meetings, which basically are uh, a subgroup of like AA that uh, for, for like physicians who have substance abuse issues. And so I remember going to, it was Vancouver and she gave a talk. She was invited to give her story. So I actually have that on tape. Um, So I listened to it a couple of times and uh, she was talking about, you know, these issues and how she became a drinker and, you know, it helped her to kind of loosen her up and it was easier. She was, she, I think she felt very awkward around people. And then when she drank, she didn't feel so awkward, you know, But she was fortunate in that she woke up shortly after I was born. Like in 1972, she realized, I've got to stop drinking. And so she joined AA and stopped drinking. And she never took a drink again. Um, And she was always on a path of self-transformation, always reading self-help books. You know, I think she really, really wanted to improve her life. My dad, unfortunately, just was where he was in his, um, in his work. So he was a nice guy, but he never stopped drinking and he was in denial and had his issues and he just never addressed them. And he was never in a position to really, I think, address them. And his, his brother, because I think, like I said, like my dad's mother, was so controlling of him throughout his adult life. Like she just, just got on him like all the time and just was like, you know, calling him all the time and doing this. And she just micromanaged his life. So he never really, I think, had to, he, I think he felt like very henpecked by his mother. Um, and, I didn't really see that side of my grandmother until he died. And I was like, whoa, this woman's horrible. And it just, I have a lot of resentment towards my grandmother, but our relationship was always, I'm the granddaughter. She's grandma. You know, it was always that kind of like, oh, I'm going to go visit my grandmother kind of thing. Like I didn't have to deal with her on a day-to-day basis. It was like, she was down in South Carolina. I'm up here. We talk on the phone. She sends me cowpeas and Christmas presents. And that's about it, you know? I, I just, I didn't have to deal with all that drama. <laughs> I didn't have to deal with it because they were in another state. Um, so I could pretend and play, you know, I'm the nice granddaughter and she's my grandmother. I didn't have to deal with all that drama and that dysfunction. Um, and it wasn't until, and my, and my mother tried to warn me. She's like, yeah, your grandmother isn't really that great. <laughs> like she's got some issues. And it wasn't until my dad died that I really got that bam. And I was angry. I was so 
angry during my dad's funeral. I just, I was, I was so mad at my grandmother. And I'm like, you probably drove him to his death because you were a controlling bitch, <laughs> you know? And I, I really don't, I don't think fondly of my grandmother because I think she was a very controlling, you know, in denial kind of person. I mean, my whole South Carolina family's got issues, you know, and, and it's very notable. I mean, there's just so much dysfunction there and it's just like, God damn, you know, um, I mean, there's, there's so many, I have so many of my cousins down there, second cousins or cousin, they've got drinking problems, substance abuse problems. It's just bad, you know, and it's that pellet kind of, I mean, they're not trailer park people, but they're just that kind of like, they're the poor genteel kind of people. Like they have, they, they have this appearance of money and we, because our family is so notable down in South Carolina, like in Charleston, I mean, we have streets named after ancestors. I mean, so it's saying like that poor genteel royalty kind of thing in that area. So it's like, it's kind of weird, but anyway, um, yeah, it's just dysfunctional. And I'm trying to address that issue because I think a lot of that came through. Um, and, it, and it's what really kind of made me interested in generational trauma um, and how this shit, how do we break the cycle. I mean, I have a second cousin who um, lost their professional license due to substance abuse. I mean, so it's, it's, it's a problem. And um, I'm always striving to kind of talk about this stuff, because I think that it is really critically important that we have more conversations, that we have more voices to the mix. Um, anyway, so yeah, I do recommend listening or getting a copy of Gabor Mate's Scattered Minds. I want to get his other book too. Um, because one of my goals that I had planned on doing for years now is to write my memoir. Um, not that I'm a really interesting, important person, but just for my own process and maybe that will help other people um, understand and hear things that they didn't hear. Because I think the media does a really piss poor job of actually illustrating. They just, they, they, they round off all of the edges and the subtleties and the nuances of these issues to create a nice little convenient stereotypical tropish package to push out there and it, it's totally overly simplified. And people don't, like, people over here are going, oh, my God. You, because they're like, they don't get the whole conversation. They're only getting, oh, people are not paying attention. Like, oh, well, of course not. They're just not getting enough discipline. Or they're, you know, social media is this. or You know, like, it's just so overly, like, the conversation, like, stop it, people. Like, we need to be able to have more voices and to be able to rationally and calmly have these conversations. And no, they're not going to be Twitter tweets back and forth. We need to actually learn how to listen and pay attention and do all this stuff and to have these conversations. And we're not because the media keeps getting in there. And while some media is okay, like, so Joe Rogan is, this is how I heard about Gabor Mate talking about his book about ADHD. And it was just a few, like a week or so ago, he was on there. And over the past few years, Joe Rogan got a shitload of criticism for his discussions during the pandemic about ivermectin. Things that were completely taken out of context. And I had out and out battles with people online because I said, you are taking everything he is saying out of context. Oh my God, he's Trump's. I mean, they just, they just made these stereotypical assumptions about Joe Rogan and how he's irresponsible and everything like that about talking about this stuff. And I said, I've been listening to Joe Rogan for years. And I'm like, he's got three hour long discussions with people and they're just having conversations, right? They're not 
interviews per se, like say, you know, Dan Rather would have an interview with somebody. I mean, there he invites people on, they have conversations that are described as interviews. And people are like, this is irresponsible. It's like, you're not even listening to the entire thing. You take one little tiny thing that he says, you pull it out of context, and then you have a little conniption fit all about it. Your panties in a bunch about this one thing he said, and you're not understanding the entire breadth of his work, of the what the conversation was about. Um, nothing. They just say, he said this little snippet of thing, and oh my God, he's this horrible person. So um, I like Joe Rogan. Hate me? I don't care. Uh, I think, you know, again, like Gabor Mate, I mean, he, he's got such a wide variety of people on his shows, including Neil deGrasse Tyson, <laughs> you know, for all you people that love that guy. Um, you know, so, I mean, he's had a wide variety of people on a show and they've got really good conversations. And I don't know why we, why so much people are just not able to have, like, sit down and really listen to them. And I guess that's just kind of your personality style. I really like having long form discussions. I, ironically, even though I have attention problems, um, I'm really, that really, it's, it's interesting to me. I get very bored by small talk. I don't like, that's probably why I'm very like, Oh God, you have no attention, but you get me into a conversation that I like. That's why these go on for so long. Um, Cause I really like to have these conversations, you know? I mean, I, I understand like somebody doesn't want to listen an hour, 45 minutes to an hour of me just chattering away unless you're really committed to the subject that I'm talking about. But I have always wanted to have, just, you know, get your glass of wine, but if you're not an alcoholic, you know, um, get your glass of wine or drink or a cup of coffee and or a cup of milk or water or whatever and sit down on the couch and just have great conversations. And I never get that. Like, I, I don't have a social network like that anymore. Um. It always ends, and I think people are terrified anymore to have those kinds of conversations due to the political climate. And we're so divided and people are just, oh, I don't want to deal with this, you know? And so we don't really ever get to understand each other. Even if there's your neighbor might have voted for Trump, which again, I don't like Trump, but maybe there's something that you would find if you actually sat down and had a beer with them and or a glass of wine and said, hey, wow, you know, oh, you know, I really care about this. I have a friend who I've been friends with since I was a wee girl, right? Um, they're very conservative and they voted for Trump. And um, but because we've been friends for so long, you know, I try to meet and understand what they're saying. And um, some stuff I agree with, some stuff I don't. And, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we talk about and I, you know, I could just have written them off and said, you know, and they may be watching this video. They knew who they are, but um, it's because, and, and they feel the same way that we've been friends. We're friends. We're not going to let political bullshit get in the way of our friendship. And there's a lot of other stuff that we can talk about, you know, and some of the stuff we talk about is political. Um, some of the stuff we agree with, like I'm, I agree with them as a liberal. I go, yeah, I can see that, you know, part because I think that a lot of our problems in society um, in understanding the way people think, feel, act, et cetera, is because we don't know how to have good conversations anymore. You know, we just don't want to listen. We like, I don't have time. I don't have time. And we tend to gravitate to only those things that, you know, really, truly bring us pleasure. But we're just so like, okay, whatever. I mean, I have no time in my life right now. I mean, I'm sitting here spending an hour because a thought came into my head and it's easier for me to talk into a camera than it is to write it down. Um, just because the way my brain is working right now, it's very hard. I actually just kind of as an aside too. Um, so yesterday I, I, I make jewelry and I do art. I have, um, and I primarily like to do it just because it's self care. I got into jewelry making a kind of by accident. 
and I kind of deep dived into it and kind of committed a little bit too much um, thinking, I'm going to make jewelry. And yeah, you know, I don't make bad jewelry. I will say that I do like my style of jewelry and some people have said that it really is good. Um, but I can't sell it. <laughs> I'm not a good, I'm not a good salesperson. Anyway, yesterday there was an art show and I just, I pushed myself to set up because of the circumstance being what it was. And I thought, I'm going to go do this. And I had some artwork that I thought it's been sitting around. And I said, yeah, let me see if I can sell this. So I, I pushed myself and I set up, I got, I made 50 bucks, sold two necklaces and a bracelet. Um, anyway, but with the proceeds, I bought this book, which is 300 more prompts. Um, I've gotten these before. Um, I got another book, I think probably by the same people. And lately I've been really struggling trying to write in my journal. I used to write a lot more prolifically than I do now. Um, but because of the way my brain is and my mental health stuff, it's really, really hard for me to sit down and do stuff. So I'm very stilted. Like I used to write letters to people too. And I'm just very stilted. I thought I need more writing prompts. So I was at Target and I found this and I flipped through it. There was another one that they had. And I decided that this was the one like write about a person you haven't seen since school that you would love to see again and why. I mean, the, those kinds of prompts. Um, <laughs> do you make enough time for what's important in your life? So I'm hoping that it will help me to kind of gather my thoughts a little bit. And I'm just going to basically the way I'm going to do it is I'm just going to kind of open it up on any given day, kind of like, oh, OK, this is the prompt today and kind of try and write something about it. So um, I got that for myself to try and help me get my thoughts down on paper. Um, cause I know that I tend to be a little bit verbose, but so calming down, I had to clean the dishes. I got to go back, dry them, put them away. I got to take the garbage out, boxes out, clean the cat boxes. I'm like, I'm trying to catch up cause I got nothing done yesterday and trying to make a little bit of semblance of my room. Um, plus I'm, I'm also going to do, so this is the other thing that I'm going to do. And I'm hoping that my insurance company will pay for it because I've met my deductible. But this is the gene site stuff. I've heard mixed things about it, quite honestly, um, which is unfortunate that people said that eh, I don't know if it really worked. But I wanted to try it if my insurance company will pay for it. So much the better. So I got to do that. I got to do a cheek swab and send that in. Oh my God. And then I've got call a guard, <laughs> which I don't really want to do. We won't go into what I have to do with that thing. Anyway, <laughs> so that's my task. So I should probably stop 45 minutes. That isn't too bad, right? But I do recommend it's called, it's called Scattered Minds uh, by Gabor Mate. Um, I recommend it if you really want to understand more about ADHD and trauma and how the brain works. Um, I kind of got off subject about, I, I've talked about it and other stuff about understanding why my mother, why I am the way I am, because my mother was a, in working in a very, very strong, probably taking sleeping pills and stimulants because she worked late nights at the hospital. She was in a fraught relationship with my father. They were, you know, thing. my dad worked overseas for almost a year. He was in Malaysia at when I was like four years old. So I was left in the hands of an 80 year old woman, probably a month into me being born because my mother, I, I asked um, one of my caregivers who I used to always call my second mother. She's a cleaner house. Um, but she also babysat me when I, you know she was one of my caregivers and I was asking her about this. I said, what do you know about Rose? Now, this what I think I talked about it. I'm going on. But anyway, this woman, Rose, was a woman who I don't have any photographs of for some strange reason. But I always heard about her. And I always heard that she was this older woman and that she was very absent minded. And one of the early stories I had is that I have a, a Snoopy doll. And 
one day my Snoopy doll head fell off and she sewed it on backwards. Um, that she threw a 100% wool sweater in the washing machine and felted it. And it was a handmade sweater that someone had made for me. I actually think I have a picture of the sweater. I mean, so, and I, I, I said, well, I want to find out what, who, who was she? Like, how long did my mother have for maternity leave being a professional doctor? And I was, it was reported that she probably had a month of maternity leave, which isn't that much, but it's about on par with what women have. Like they've got what, six weeks of maternity leave or something like two months. Um, and so then I was, my dad was working. So I was left in the, and I'm like, well, where did she come? Like, where did my mother find this woman? And apparently it was from some person, volunteer that knew my mother at the hospital. And it was his girlfriend, an 80 year old woman. Right. And she hired her. And this woman allegedly would sit around and smoke cigarettes and watch TV and she's like, oh, yeah, and I would come in to clean the house and you'd be sitting in your dirty diaper and everything. So apparently I was left at a very formative time in my life while my mother was busy working at the hospital and was on call. So or bonding. My I was not breastfed because my mother got pleurisy. Uh, she worked with me, pregnant with me. Um, and from a very stressful time. So she had late nights at the hospital. She, you know, it was, it was very stressful. Anesthesiology is one of the most stressful, hard medical professions, apart from a surgeon. Like you've got your anesthesiologists and your surgeons, and they're like some of the most difficult professions. Okay. And she worked late nights. She had on call. So she was very harried, you know, so we didn't bond basically. I was not breastfed, so we didn't bond there. And then I was left in the hands of this questionable caregiver who was neglecting me. So I look, and, and Gabor Mate in his book literally describes that whole scenario and says, this will affect you. I mean, these connections, because, you know, we have nine months in the womb, but we are the only species really that has a formative up, you know, year plus where we're continuing to develop our nervous system outside of the womb. And that's a critical period. Like we're not born, we're still like very sensitive to our environment. So if you like people think, oh, okay, well, that's fine, you know, and the way parenting was, was like, let the cop kid try, you know, cry it out the whole nine yards. Um, although Dr. Spock was, was there and he got a lot of crap too. I don't know that much about Dr. Spock. I just know that they, he was like, Oh my God, you know, again, it's all the conservatives it drives me nuts. Anyway. <laughs> um, and my mother had the Dr. Spock book, actually, I've got to find out more about him, but anyway, um, that there's this formative year, this formative time after you're born that can influence. So you've got, there's, you know, while ADHD isn't genetic in the way we think it's genetic, there is a genetic, an epigenetic uh, component. So the way the genes express themselves, they turn on and off and they adapt to in utero environments. That's why, you know, you've got a, you know, certain things. Um, and then after you're born, your environment, how well you connect and bond to your primary caregiver or your mother, um, that didn't happen because I was not breastfed. This is a time they had very regimented uh, birth stuff. I've got the instructions, like very, very regimented, very like, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. These are the times that you have to like breastfeed. I mean, it was just crazy. I mean, it was just like, I've got the instructions from the hospital that state that. And it's just like, it just, it's so unnatural and so harsh and so weird, you know? Um, I was probably kept in the nursery, you know, with the other babies, you know, because that's the way they used to do it. You you didn't stay with your mother because they're like, oh, well, the mother needs to sleep, you know, now. And I mean, yes, that's true, but it's kind of like, <laughs> you know, 
I wasn't breastfed, so I didn't have that nurturing. My mother was, in addition, she was sick. So she had pleurisy. So she felt like crap. So we didn't really, I don't think my mother and I bonded the way we needed to. And so my nervous system didn't get whatever it needed to. And then further, we only had a a month probably of her and she was sick from part of that time. And then I was taken and put in the hands of an 80 year old woman that neglected me. So, and people go, well, that's an excuse or you know, that's like quit living in the past, but you need to understand that. And, and I understand that, you know, I can't live there for the rest of my life, but I understanding that and going, Oh, because 80, and that's just in description of ADHD. Um, But a lot of people are like, Oh, ADHD is my superpower kind of thing. I mean, I have a lot more going on with a dysregulated nervous system and a dysregulated, I have cortisol dysregulation. They were talking about how cortisol in the mother, if that's not in balance, it can definitely affect the child. Um, So it just explains so much more because I grew up and I'm thinking, I have anxiety and ADHD. I get that. But why do I have such, why is I'm so moody? Why am I so depressed all the time? Why am I always suicidal? Why am I all these other things? And it's like, oh, because all of this is a lot more than just having a little bit of ADHD. You know, Um, you're a little bit distracted. It's not just that. It's a lot more. And I didn't get things that I needed. And that's no real fault of my mother. She did the best she could. Um, But it was the time and the place. And I understand that other people have and he explains this too that that why some people have similar things and they turn out fine whereas other people have other things and they don't so i go but i had this i had all this stuff why did i grow up so dysregulated and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on even though my mother was a well-paid doctor and I went to private schools, that didn't do anything for me, you know? I mean, that did nothing for me. I mean, that's nice, great. I mean, you know, but shaming me and saying, you should be more grateful. You had all this stuff given to you. You're, you should be happy. You should be happy. You should be, you know, more well-adjusted. You should be this, you should be that. There's no excuse. I mean, I get that message like all the time from people spoken and unspoken. I get it in comments. I get it in the media. I've got, I've so ingrained in my head because that is all I've ever heard is that I should be more grateful, that I should be more blessed. Like I'm so blessed. Like I'm so lucky. And I look and I go, oh, you know, cause you're, like, you're not like that, you know, but all this stuff that I did have didn't really do me any good. And then, of course, then you're blamed for it, saying, well, it must be a flaw in your character then. You're lazy, you're stupid, you're dumb, you're spoiled, you're selfish. And that just exacerbates everything. So it doesn't really help. So we need to have better conversations. We need to have a little bit more empathy and understanding and nuance in our conversations. So we're listening and that we can understand each person's unique circumstances and why they ended up the way that they ended up and, and, and rather than more judgment, we don't need more judgment in this world. We really don't. I don't care if it's coming from the right or the left, no more judgment. Stop it. We need to be able to have good conversations and to be able to heal the world and the wounds that we all have as a society and need to be able to evolve out of this stuff because it's getting worse, not better. So anyway, with that, We're on to an hour, and I thank you very much for joining me, Um, and you all have a great rest of the day, and I'm going to try and shove in the rest of all the stuff that i got to do today. All right, bye. Let me find the, I have to, to do this.